Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's event. If I could get my first slide, please. Great, thank you. My name is Brian Berg. I'm proud to be a core member here of the Computer History Museum. I'm an independent consultant and also do a lot of volunteer work with IEEE. Some of my involvement has included being past chair of the local Santa Clara Valley section. Also, I'm the milestone coordinator for Region 6, which is the Western United States. Also, a member of the uh, Consultants Network Board as a director and past chair. I'm liaison for the Women in Engineering Affinity Group within IEEE for our local section, and also a part of the uh, uh, History Committee. So, the a little bit of background about the Santa Clara Valley section. Uh, our section is one of 333 sections in the world, and it's one of the uh, sponsors of today's event, along with Qualcomm, and also along with a very generous contribution from the Computer History Museum itself. Our section has about 13,000 members, and it's the largest in the world, as I said. The second largest, just for comparison, is the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland together. So, as you'd expect, Silicon Valley has a very large presence. In fact, how many people here today are members of IEEE? Great, and how many people here are present or past officers of IEEE? Great, happy to have you all here, w welcome. Uh, wanted to remind anybody who's not heard about it, uh, the local IEEE uh, sections within the Bay Area have a, uh, a resource called the eGrid. It's a website as well as a semi-monthly email that goes out talking about all of the many events that happen every month here in the Bay Area. We have lots of events. In fact, if you wanted to be a full-time IEEE event attendee, it's probably pretty easy to do in this part of the world. If you don't already get those emails, you can sign up uh, at the e-grid.net website if you want. I want to tell you a little bit about the rich relationship of IEEE with the museum. Many of the docents who are at the Revolutions ex exhibition downstairs are IEEE members. In fact, before the uh, exhibition opened in early 2011, a number of IEEE members were rounded up to be docents, and they continue to be very actively involved with that. In addition, uh, any IEEE member is allowed to become uh, a member of the museum uh, at a half-price discount. And also, uh, there have been many uh, IEEE milestones that have been uh, dedicated here at the museum. Those milestones include the integrated circuit back in 2009, in fact, there's a milestone plaque just down the street uh, at Fairchild in Palo Alto that was dedicated just before one of the two evening events here at the museum. Also, the first ARPANET transmission in 2009 was dedicated simultaneous to the anniversary, the 125th anniversary of the IEEE that celebrated here at the museum. Also, the SPICE circuit simulation software developed by Larry Nagel over at UC Berkeley, that milestone was dedicated here as well as one for the EEPROM and flash memory, one that I was uh, directly involved with and was dedicated almost exactly two years ago here at the museum. Uh, just a little bit of background. Milestones honor either an invention, a location, or an event. Examples include the integrated circuit invention and the uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator Center location up in Menlo Park, as well as the first ARPANET transmission event from UCLA to SRI in Menlo Park. There's a bronze plaque that's placed in an appropriate location for those milestones, and over 140 of those milestones have been dedicated so far. An additional note is that next year, there'll be a special citation plaque that will be received by the museum, so you'll probably be hearing news at some point next year about this plaque being dedicated here at the museum. So right here downstairs, there'll be a plaque for the museum in a permanent location. In case you've never seen one of these plaques, this is a picture of the one for the RAMAC. This is the 1956 IBM invention uh, that was developed right in downtown San Jose between 52 and 56, and included the world's first magnetic disk drive. So on to today's presentation. I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Dilip Bundarkar here. He has a very rich history in the computing field. He's managed processor and system architecture for the VAX, PRISM, MIPS and Alpha architectures while at Digital Equipment. And when he was at TI, he, he researched magnetic bubble memories, charged coupled devices, fault tolerant memories, and computer architecture. In the CTO office of Intel's Digital Enterprise Group, he was a director of advanced architecture, a lead spokesperson for the Intel servers, as well as an, an Intel distinguished lecturer. As a distinguished engineer at Microsoft, 
He was responsible for cloud server architecture and data center infrastructure. He is now Vice President of Technology at Qualcomm, where he's working on next generation computing platforms. He holds 16 US patents and has published more than 30 technical papers. He's an IEEE Fellow for Contributions and Technical Leadership in the Design of Complex and Reduced Instruction Set Architecture and in Computer System Performance Analysis. He is recognized as a distinguished alumnus of the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay, where he received his bachelor's in EE. His master's and doctorates in EE are from Carnegie Mellon University. He's done graduate work in business administration at the University of Dallas. His talk today is titled, From Mainframe to Smartphone, What an Amazing Trip It's Been, Dilip. Congratulations. Thank, mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Brian. If you like the title of this talk, uh, you can say thanks to, to Brian. I had a much more boring title, but uh, uh, Brian bailed me out. Uh, this journey of mine started almost exactly 44 years ago today. Uh, 44 years ago today, I was somewhere between Bombay and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, on my way to a career that I had no clue what was going to happen. So join me in this, uh, this, this journey. So fasten your seat belts, and we're going to run through this fairly quickly. You know, a lot of corporate presentations have uh, uh, safe harbor statements. Here's, here's mine. The thing to remember is what I'm about to say today is, is my opinion not blessed or not approved by my current or previous employers. So that way I can say whatever I feel like. So it stops along the journey. Uh, as I said, I, I left uh, India in 1970. Uh, I was at Carnegie Mellon, where I was a student of uh, Gordon Bell, who started this museum. Spent some time at Texas Instruments, and then joined Gordon again at Digital Equipment, and they just couldn't resist the temptation of coming to the West Coast and working for Intel. And, and then spent some time at Microsoft, and I'll get more into how all that happened uh, during the course of this uh, presentation. So in getting ready for this uh, presentation, I found this uh, on the museum site, and I realized that they missed one important milestone that happened in 1958 when Jack Kilby of Texas Instrument uh, invented the integrated circuit, which should have been somewhere in the middle, middle there. It's from the transistor to the integrated circuit. Bob Noyce at, at Intel also in the same time did a similar thing. I think Jax was in, in germanium, uh, Bob's was in, sil in uh, silicon. So over this time period, we've gone from small scale integration to medium scale to large scale to very large scale. And I think where we're at today can only be described as, oh my god, what large scale integration. <laughs> And this was all powered uh, by uh, Moore's Law. Uh, so my first three years were, were spent uh, in, in graduate school. But while I was there, there were a lot of things happening in the industry that were uh, quite significant. The first being in 1971, when, when Intel uh, announced the 4004. And the inventors of the 4004 are now uh, fellows of this Computer History Museum. You can see it was a, a fairly modest 2300 transistors in 10 micron technology. Uh, same year, Intel also introduced the 1K DRAM, which was used uh, to build uh, memories for many computers and mainframes. And as you can see, uh, the, the, the memory boards didn't look like the DIMMs we have today. They put these chips on some pretty large boards, and then they plugged into some sort of backplane in large computers, and they replaced the uh, core memory uh, pretty rapidly. So while I was at, at CMU, uh, I, had, I had the opportunity, or, or maybe I shouldn't call it opportunity. I, I suffered the use of uh, mainframe computers, especially the ones that you, you took uh, card decks to, drop them in, into the hopper for batch computing, and then came ev every couple of hours to see if there was a line printer, printer listing saying that you missed a comma someplace in your, in your program. <laughs> we did have time sharing on the 360-67, but the EE department didn't have the budget to allow us to use time sharing. Uh, so it was kind of a, a pretty tough period. But in those days, the mainframes uh, were provided by eight companies, and they were called Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Uh, after my first year, when I got my master's, my research was funded by the computer science department, and I had access to the DEC PDP-10. And I thought I'd died and gone to heaven because this was time sharing. And there was a, a fun experience. So this was my, my first real experience with, with, with digital. That helped me get my 
my thesis done uh, by, the, by September 1973, and I was also fortunate to have access to some of the early, uh, a very early prototype of the Xerox graphics printer, and that allowed me to turn around my thesis uh, uh, drafts within days, whereas uh, most of my colleagues in the EE department had to pay a typist to type it, and then somebody marked it up, and then you had to go back to the typist, and it took weeks to turn around uh, uh, you know, different versions. And it turns out that the software that ran uh, on the PDP uh, 1120 was developed by Chuck Geschke, who is also a fellow of this museum, and went on to found uh, Adobe later on. Now, the way this, this talk kind of happened was uh, I was the first uh, presenter at the first annual Symposium on Computer Architecture uh, in 1973, and I gave a 40-year history of what happened at the 40th anniversary of that conference in Israel last year. So that's how it, this all got started. So, I, so fresh with my PhD in hand, uh, I decided that I want to go off and discover new grounds. So I, I joined the semiconductor company, uh, Texas Instruments. And at that time, they had just introduced the 4K DRAM. It fit in a 22-pin pin package. Now, when you took that, uh, that DRAM and you put that on that board that I showed you, uh, you couldn't pack as much memory capacity on, on a board. And then some of the customers that TI had were not quite happy about that. Mostic was late to the 4K DRAM, and they seized the opportunity to create a 16-pin package so you could put more of these chips on a board. And the way they did that is you can see there's a difference of, of six pins. They split the address into row and column address and gave it in, in two clock cycles. And this is how RAS gas happened, and we still have that today. So this is part of my uh, TI adventure. I worked on bubble memories. We thought we were going to uh, beat out hard drives. Never happened. So you learn a lot from failures like that that revolutionary technologies often have a hard time beating evolutionary technologies. The other fun thing I did was I thought, you know, it would be great if you had redundant columns uh, in these DRAMs so you could improve the yield. Uh, so I went and talked to my colleagues in the memory division, and they said, you're crazy. You know, if there's a fault or a, or a de defect in a piece of silicon, it's going to spread like a cancer. So if, if there's a fault, we, we can't use that chip. Turns out six, uh, when they got to 64K DRAMs, everybody started using uh, redundant rows, and all I have is a crisp dollar bill I got for filing this patent. <laughs> so working at TI was also sort of like going back to the future. Uh, we had three seventies again, carrying that deck of cards uh, and waiting for you know hours to get your results back. So I was so frustrated at TI that they didn't understand computer architecture. I said, I'm never going to work for a semiconductor company again. I want to work for a real computer company. So I went and joined Digital Equipment Corporation, and you'll see what happened later in my life. Uh, <coughs> uh, so I spent 17 and a half years at Digital. Most of them were good and fun, but there were some tough times too. And you learn a lot from the tough times. So I was hired to be the PDP-11 architect. And when I joined, the, the big PDP-11 was the 1170, uh, shown at the bottom here. It took a lot of boards to, to do it. But over time, uh, we did a lot of interesting things. On the top is, is what was called Tiny 11, which fit on a, on a single board computer. And then there was the F11, which was part of the, the LSI 1123. It's two, it was called the Fonz internally, but we called it F11. It was launched. Uh, J11 was JAWS. Uh, so, between the time I accepted the job offer from Digital and my first day, they launched VAX. And I said, why am I going there to be the PDP-11 architect when they have this brand new thing called VAX? I said, well, let, we'll see what, what happens. So the day I, I started at Digital on January 3rd, 1978, my manager came up to me and gave me this thick three-ring binder and said, guess what? You are the new VAX architect, and you better learn this thing very quickly, because the people working on the other implementations on Comet and Nebula are going to come and ask you questions about how everything works. <laughs> Can you imagine trusting a new hire with this, that kind of responsibility? I guess they, they probably had more confidence in me than I had myself. So, 
So we took the Vax family uh, over the years through a lot of changes. One of the first things that I was involved in the evolution of the Vax architecture was uh, changes to the floating point architecture. We added two new data types, changed the exception behavior, uh, and then things kind of proceeded uh, you know, as, as normal. We went to higher performance machines. And then uh, around 1986, uh, Digital did this project called, called Scorpio, which was the first real VLSI full Vax. Now, when, in doing that, we realized that it took, took too many chips. There were like four or five in the, in the chipset to implement the full VAX instruction set. Uh, so we decided that in order to uh, make things smaller, we needed to subset the instruction. So I was responsible for defining that microVAX uh, subset, which allowed us to fit everything uh, into a single chip. And a lot of the instructions were relegated to uh, software emulation. So that learning experience uh, led us to MicroVax 2, uh, which was launched in 1985. Another sort of historical uh, factor here is that when we were looking at MicroVax 2, we had talked to National Semiconductor and tried to get them to license VAX and build MicroVax and sell it as a merchant uh, semiconductor chip, but somehow the negotiations never uh, kind of got to any reasonable conclusion. Uh, they had already launched it the 32 or 32, and they couldn't take on a, a, another one, so went, we went on and, and did it ourselves. So then we took the, the, the MicroVax instruction set and wrote that through uh, multiple implementations. There was a CMOS VAX or CVAX. There was Mariah, Mariah in between, but I couldn't fit this on the, on the slide, uh, followed by Rigel, and finally NVAX. And by the time we got to NVAX, uh, we were getting some really good performance with, uh, with these, this semiconductor technology. In 1989, we launched uh, the VAX 9000. So somewhere in the, in the mid-'80s, uh, Digital decided they wanted to be more like IBM and build these monster machines uh, with water-cooled uh, uh, modules, and it was a disaster. By that time, NVAX had already uh, delivered almost the same performance at a much lower, lower cost. Uh, so in that time frame, we also then uh, got into the risk versus CISC wars. Uh, Dave Patterson came and spent one of his sabbaticals with us at DEC, and I remember all the lunchtime conversations on which is better, risk or CISC. Uh, towards the, uh, the end of, uh, when was it, 89? Somewhere in the late 80s, uh, Spark was launched. Uh, MIPS was launched. So in, uh, I guess, 87 is when Spark came out. So digital started in 1985, an effort called PRISM. And there were five of us listed at the bottom here who were given the task of defining a new instruction set to replace VAX uh, for the future. Uh, it was called PRISM. It, was, it never got full backing of the entire company. Uh, we had limited funding, so the project kind of was delayed. Things didn't go as well. So it was canceled in 1998 and we decided to adopt MIPS instead. Well, later on, uh, some enterprising engineers in, in Hudson, Massachusetts, uh, took the, the PRISM manual and substituted everywhere it said PRISM and called it EVAX. The fact that, that it was called VAX or extended VAX suddenly made it politically acceptable, and the project was funded and launched in 1992 as Alpha AXP. Uh, one of my colleagues said, hmm, AXP, huh? Almost exactly, PRISM. <laughs> so <clears throat> during this risk versus sys debate, uh, we launched Alpha, so that was fine. Uh, I worked on it, worked on, on some of the Alpha server products. Uh, there was the, the question of, you know, is risk better than, 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 than CISC? Uh, and in, in, in those, those debates, uh, we would debate with the, with the Intel folks. And we quickly realized that when we were building in-order machines, the risk processors had better performance. But as soon as we went to out-of-order with the P6, it changed everything. So when you go to an out-of-order order, uh, implementation, the instruction set only defines the, the front end. The back end is, is almost the same. If you want to have lots of instructions in flight, uh, do all of that stuff, it's about the same complexity. And, and then uh, it was a big learning experience that semiconductor technology and volume economics is hard to beat. So that's how Intel succeeded against uh, things like, like Alpha. 
So the learning for me there was the difference between theory and practice is always greater in practice than it is in theory. So in theory, risk was better, but in practice, uh, the x86 won out. So while we were still, uh, at, uh, still at digital, we decided that we could displace this x86 uh, with MIPS processors. The R4000 was in, in design, and so with a, a lot of our fellow travelers, we launched what was called the ACE Initiative, hoping that the R4000 would give us enough of a performance boost so that people would use Windows NT on the R4000 instead of the x86. Well, unfortunately, MIPS couldn't deliver. I used to come here on a monthly basis, and every month I came, the schedule slipped by another month. So by the time the R4000 came out, it was too little too late. Intel had gotten its act together on, on the Pentium processor, and the ACE initiative was dead. Learning here is strategy without execution doesn't work. So now back to my, my alpha story. I was one of the alpha architects. In fact, I was the prism architect. And except for the, you know, they made some small changes uh, uh, before they called it alpha. In my not so humble opinion, digital would have been better staying on MIPS instead of launching alpha. Why? Because over the three years, between MIPS and Alpha, we had slowly built up the software ecosystem for MIPS. And by the time we launched Alpha, it was the fifth instruction set architecture, uh, risk-based instruction set architecture. And I can't tell you how many ISVs would tell me, tell me why I should support yet another instruction set, how many more licenses am I going to sell, and I'm going to have to support one more. And by the way, you have three different operating systems, Windows NT, OpenVMS, uh, and, and a version of Unix. Which one do you want me to support? So it was too little too late. So this is when I realized that I needed a change. So I mailed in my manuscript to the publisher, and I walked into my manager's office at DEC and said, bye-bye, I'm off. <clears throat> so that's when I joined, joined Intel, but we'll get to that later. So uh, Intel is a big part of computing history, so I thought we'd sp spend some time uh, looking at, at Intel, me looking at Intel from the outside before I joined Intel. So we talked about the 4004, there was the uh, 8008, and then the 8080 was uh, uh, also quite significant. There were lots of other companies that also built 8080, and I think uh, the, the group at TI also had a version of the 8080. So it, was, it got used in the Altair machine, uh, and you could buy a kit for under $400, again, 4,500 transistors, uh, 2 megahertz. But the real big thing that, that put Intel on the map for microprocessors was this design win with IBM, where IBM decided to go with the 8088 instead of the Motorola uh, 6800. And uh, the Fortune magazine clearly uh, uh, called this the business triumph of the 70s, and that was certainly true. And this put Intel back onto the map because the memory business for Intel had already tanked by then. So looking at the first IBM PC in 1981, uh, it cost about uh, $3,000, and it came with about 64K bytes. And of course, uh, you can see why one of the reasons why a company like Digital failed, we just couldn't understand why people would want a personal computer. <clears throat> uh, so I, I thought I should mention the 68,000. It was a much better instruction set, uh, cleaner than the x86. Uh, it got used by a lot of Unix-based workstations and ultimately found its way into the Macintosh. But again, the learning here is instruction set cleanliness is neither necessary nor sufficient for business success. And the x86 is, proves that. So the next big thing was 32-bit x86. Uh, John Crawford was the architect, and he was uh, just, now, just uh, appointed a, a fellow of this museum a, a few months ago. And it was the first 32-bit x86 chip. It supported virtual memory um, and ran at some you know, moderate speeds. Intel followed that with the 486. Uh, it was the first x86 processor to include a on-chip cache. And I put large in quotes because on the Intel website, when they posted this, it was a large 8K unified instruction and data cache. And, and in those days, that was large. Uh, it was built in one micron technology, and it was you know, quite successful. And then came the Pentium. And 
as I walked into the, the museum today, I, I saw some uh, Apple-related uh, uh, postings there, and it said that even Steve Jobs said that it was the coolest thing that happened in the industry uh, when, when the Pentium was, was announced. So Pentium was the first superscalar x86, and it was uh, starting to, to move Intel up from sort of, you know, PCs. Uh, Compaq started using it in some of their sort of entry-level server products, and this was sort of the, the, the beginning of the x86 uh, dominance. It was the first x86 built in submicron technology. I remember my, in, in 1973 when I joined Texas Instruments, we were fretting over the fact of what was going to happen when we got to submicron technology. Well, evolution and Moore's law fixed that. But I think if I look at what's happened in the industry, this is probably one of the biggest things that has happened uh, in the industry. Uh, I would never have thought that anybody could build an out-of-order x86 processor, and I think there were lots of people inside of Intel who didn't believe that either. But the design team in Oregon proved everybody wrong, and they, got, they finished Pentium Pro, got it right, and it had excellent performance. It was an out-of-order machine. In fact, compared to the alphas that I was working on at DEC, it, its integer performance was close. The floating point was not quite there. And, and this is what started killing off the RISC processors. When I saw this in 1995, I knew it was game over for Alpha, and I decided to, you couldn't, to, to join Intel in, in 1995. So now on, on to uh, my life at, at Intel, 12 years. So we followed the, the, the Pentium Pro with the, with the Pentium 2 processor. What we did with the, the, the Pentium processor has a, had a backside bus uh, on, on which the, the, the L2 cache was a special chip. Uh, we created two different versions. There was a slot one uh, Pentium 2 processor which had standard SRAMs that, that were used for uh, the, the, the cache. And then a year later we, we launched the Pentium 2 Xeon for, for servers where instead of using uh, standard SRAMs that ran at half the clock rate of the CPU. They ran at, at full speed and, and were quite successful getting into the, the, the server space. <clears throat> Around 1998, Cytex started to make our life difficult. They launched a, a low-cost processor targeted for under $1,000 PCs. Can you imagine back then, most of the PCs that were sold, sold for more than $1,000. And Cytex had this processor uh, that they said they could, they could sell so that the bill of materials came out to such that you could sell it for less than $1,000. That got a lot of people at Intel nervous. So the first thing we did is we took that Pentium 2 and just took off those external SRAM cells and sold it without a L2 cache in, in the cartridge format, and that was called Covington. And that was in 1990, uh, early 1998. And, and then uh, one of my colleagues, Nimish Modi, I had a very quick project where he, he took that, that old Pentium 2 die and added an on-die L2 cache in 28 kilobytes. And this was the first time uh, on the, in the x86 history that anybody had an on-die L2 cache. So it showed up in Celeron before it showed up in, on Pentium. <clears throat> now things started getting really interesting as, as AMD picked up the, the K6 uh, team and started to compete with us. So there was a big race on who can get to one gigahertz. Remember, clock rate meant everything uh, back in those days. And unfortunately, AMD beat us to the punch and got to one gigahertz. I don't remember whether it was a few hours or just a few days before uh, we got to one, one, one gigahertz. So I, I still have uh, a shirt that says uh, copper mine one gigahertz to remind me uh, that uh, we weren't the first. The other thing that AMD did in, in 2009 was Intel refused to extend the x86 to 64 bits. Why? Because that would have killed off Itanium. But that opened the door for AMD uh, to do exactly that. And in October 2009, and I think it was at Microprocessor Forum, that Fred Weber announced that they were going to extend the x86 architecture. They called it AMD 64 or x86 uh, 
Dash 64, uh, and they said they were going to deliver it uh, within, within two years. So that sent a whole panic attack uh, inside of, of, of Intel. In early 2000, I was given the task of working with a small group of my colleagues to figure out how we were going to respond, and I'll get to what we did a little bit later. <clears throat> so in the meantime, uh, we did get our copper mine up to uh, one gigahertz, but it was uh, you know, a few days after AMD did. So in 2000, uh, the, the team that did the Pentium Pro uh, did their next microarchitecture, uh, and this was launched as, as Willamette. It had a very deep pipeline, and it had an inner core that ran at twice the, the, the frequency of, of the rest of the, of the processor. So since frequency sold, you know, people liked it, but it turned out that the power also went up quite, quite a lot. At 55 watts, there was no way we could scale it down to fit into notebooks. Uh, the, the normal Intel thing was to, to develop processors for the desktop. They were 30, 35 watts. Then you'd voltage scale it and frequency scale it down to fit into a 15 to 20 watt uh, envelope that worked in, in, <coughs> in laptops uh, back then. So it had high frequency, uh, but it also had high power. At about the same time, uh, Transmeta launched uh, Crusoe and said, you know, this is much more energy efficient. This is what you need to use for, for notebooks. So that lit another uh, fire inside of Intel. And one of the things about Intel is that whenever they're pushed and shoved with competition, they're at their best. Otherwise, it's very easy to get complacent. <clears throat> and I think a lot of successful companies are that way. Now, in 2001, Intel launched their biggest mistake. <laughs> it was called Epic, but I call it Intel's Epic Blunder. And there's no truth to the rumor that some creative marketing person wrote, it ain't Pentium on his whiteboard, and then erased enough letters to, uh, to spell Itanium. I did that within two minutes of hearing the Itanium code name. <clears throat> and I think one of my disappointments is that I was absolutely unable to convince Intel management to not do Itanium to kill it. Uh, there were some contractual agreements with, with HP they would have been much better off pay, paying the penalty for killing Itanium than spending all the money they did on Itanium. And now that I don't work for Intel, I can say Itanium was horrible. <laughs> so that was the, one of the good things that happened when I left. I didn't have to stand up there and say how good it was. So in 2001 was the first branding of, of, of Xeon. We introduced uh, the Pentium 4 uh, in a different form factor with simultaneous multi-threading, and it was called uh, Pentium uh, 4 Xeon. And that, that name stuck for a while because the name Xeon didn't have any, any brand equity, and then a few years later, uh, we, we dropped the, 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 the Pentium and it became just, just Xeon. So that, that x86-64 that AMD promised in 1999 would ship in two years, well, it took them four years to ship it, uh, but it was the first x86 processor with 64 bits, and they integrated the memory controller. Uh, we still had the front side bus and needed a, a separate memory controller to address memory. So in, in response to the uh, threat from Transmeta, uh, we decided to double down and do something special and unique for notebooks. And originally, this project called Banyas in Israel was supposed to be the next Celeron processor. And when I visited the design team in, in, in Israel and, and looked at what they had, I realized that they really had a, had a gem. Uh, this particular processor delivered almost the same integer performance at Prescott in a die size that was about half and, and, and half the power. So I was able to convince uh, Intel management that we should make this mobile only. But the response to me is, all of that is good, but it doesn't have frequency. How do we sell it? So the marketing uh, folks were given the challenge, and this is when they came up with the platform branding of in Intel Centrino mobile technology that had four pillars, uh, mobile performance, not mobile frequency, mobile performance, you know, you can uh, be on a coast-to-coast on a -coast flight and, and battery life, and you can watch an entire video without the, the power going down. And uh, Wi-Fi became an integral part of the platform, and because it was lower power, it fit in thin and light notebooks. And just to put things in perspective, back then, the, the one-inch ThinkPad was considered to be thin and light. 
And this is what, what started the, the, the move away from core frequency uh, to performance and the emphasis on more uh, power efficient cores. So in 2004, a year after AMD launched their 64 bits, we launched Prescott with 64 bits. So I remember this on, on 29th of June, 2000, uh, we had a very small meeting with about two dozen people on what we should do about this x86-64. And we made two decisions. One was that we had to extend x86 to 64 bits. And then the second, and, 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 but do it in a stealthy way so that hardly anybody in the company knew what we were up to except for a subset of the design team that needed to know what they were designing. Uh, the, we did not tell the, the marketing and PR people at large. In fact, it was good that the PR people didn't know because if somebody called them and said, are you extending, putting 64 bits in Prescott? And they would honestly say, I don't know of such a product, project because they weren't told. So the other thing we, we did was we thought maybe we could have our own version of 64 bits, but we decided to copy AMD, be fully compatible. And I think that was probably one of the most important things I did at Intel, but I never got an award for it for not creating another instruction set. Uh, uh, and it, it was the right decision uh, both for the industry because the industry certainly did not need an, another instruction set. And it was the right thing for Intel also, because all the software is already being developed on the AMD chip. And so when we had our first silicon, we had a, whole, a, a lot of 64-bit software that we could run to verify our implementation. And by the time we launched uh, Prescott, uh, you know, the 64-bit the Windows was available, and we were able to just uh, uh, load that and, and, and run it. But another. Uh, Interesting story here is I had a big uh, debate with the marketing guys. I said, we should say that we're fully compatible with AMD 64. They said, we can't say that. Uh, we can't say that we're compatible. So what the compromise was, we can run the same software as AMD 64. Go look up the definition of uh, compatible in the dictionary and see what it says. <laughs> it says, it runs the same software. <clears throat> so we had, by this time, uh, seen that it was getting increasingly difficult to push uh, single thread performance. So the industry was starting to move towards a multi-core uh, era. And clearly AMD again, once again, beat us to the punch on, a, on, a, uh, on the first dual core machine in 2005. You know, we were in the meantime continuing uh, on the path of, of polishing the uh, Pentium 4 and the last of the uh, Intel Netburst architecture, Pentium 4, Cedar Mill, launched in 2005, and with that, we ended the frequency madness and went to more efficient cores. So if you look at historically uh, how we had evolved uh, from the 486 at three watts, by the time we got to, the, to Pentium D, uh, we were at 115 watts. Clearly, that wasn't sustainable going forward. So starting with Pentium M, which was Banyas, we could see that we could get much better performance per watt with a different uh, implementation. And that became the basis of a, of a product family that today uh, is, is what, you, what you see in, on the Intel roadmap. So well, the next step after Banyas was a dual core Yona uh, built in 90 nanometer, uh, uh, 65 nanometer uh, process technology. And the claim to fame for this processor, this was the first x86 uh, that found its way into Macintoshes. And then this was the beginning of the, the multiple mo mobile cores. Why did we go to, to, to multi-core? Clearly, as I said, it was getting more difficult. Technology wasn't giving us the same scaling factors on frequency, capacitance, and, and voltage. Instruction level parallelism was harder to find. And the design complexity was getting uh, too high. So to, to illustrate that, what I've shown here in, in, in the middle is sort of a, a baseline design, okay? Now, if I want to improve its performance, I can overclock it, raise the, the voltage by 20%, uh, which raises the frequency by 20%, but the power goes up by about 73%, okay? Not good. So let's look at the right-hand side. If I lower the voltage by 20%, it reduces my frequency by 20%. And now if I put a second core running at that lower clock frequency, I still get my 73% performance, but now my power is roughly the same. 
And this is sort of the high level explanation of why multi-core makes sense. So we went from Banyas to Dothan. Dothan was a single uh, core to dual core Iona. And, and then we added 64 bits to these mobile processors and the core two duo family came about in 2006. And this was another transformational event for, for, for Intel. A single piece of silicon designed in Israel and put Intel back uh, onto the competitive roadmap in the x86 space. We took that same piece of silicon and created three different uh, products by fusing out uh, things that were not important for that segment. Uh, you don't want to give people things that they're not willing to pay for. And if you've got a feature that somebody's like, uh, if power management, the mobile guys will pay you a premium for that, you leave that in. So there was Woodcrest, Conroe, and Merome. And thanks to the Intel Design Center uh, in, in, in Israel, uh, Intel was back on track. So if you look at sort of historically how Intel has progressed, typically what we did was, was design, and I should say they because I wasn't there for most of this time. The first implementation of anything was a fairly big die. Uh, so you could only uh, price it for the top end of, uh, of, of PCs, high-end PCs. But as Moore's law gave you uh, higher density, you can see that the die size kind of came down and then it kind of waterfalled into more mainstream segments. So this is how uh, Intel's processors have, have evolved. Now this was a fun, fun project that uh, uh, a member of my team uh, did. We wanted to get to quad core because we thought we needed that to compete against AMD. Doing a monolithic quad core would have taken a lot of time. So what we did was simply took two of those dual core processors, put them in the same package and joined them at the bus. Quick and dirty innovation, got to market quickly, sold a lot of these, but AMD said, well, that's not really quad core. Who cares what's inside? To the customer, it's a quad core. Turns out two years later, AMD did exactly the same thing with some of the high-end uh, optrons. <clears throat> All right, one nice thing about it and I, I can't be totally negative, was the first processor to hit uh, a billion transistors in 2006. So if you look at Moore's law, going from 2,300 transistors in the 4004 to over a billion transistors in less than 40 years in 2006. <clears throat> So my last hurrah at, at Intel was uh, on Pendrin. Uh, this was designed as a, as a client processor. I had a, a project in place called Dunnington where we were, uh, the, the, the Pendrin team was gonna give us some white space to put ECC features and some other things that are important for servers. Uh, management decided to cancel it. I wasn't happy, so I said time for a change. Uh, that's the thing, if you're not happy, there's two things you can do. One is accept what's happening and stop complaining or go someplace else. I've been lucky enough that when I got to that state that something else came to me. So I got a call to join Microsoft during Bill Gates' last year uh, to build out their uh, cloud infrastructure. So a couple of nice things about uh, leaving Intel and joining Microsoft, I no longer had to guess what AMD was going to do. AMD came and showed me their roadmap, right? <laughs> uh, and you know, we were quite excited about um, Barcelona, a quad-core project, but AMD just could not deliver. They had uh, issues with it, which allowed Intel to catch up, and Nahalem, which was still in design in 2007 when I, when I left, and I had something to do with uh, what Nahalem was, uh, managed to ship before AMD could solve all of the problems with Barcelona, and, and now Intel had integrated the memory controller uh, and abandoned the front side bus. So then you know, we went to, to six cores, so going from Nahalem to Westmere uh, and AMD going to Istanbul, Intel slowly started to increase their lead over, over AMD, and AMD, which had like a 20% share uh, of the, I don't remember, the PC market or the server market, uh, started to slowly decline. So what do I do at, at Microsoft? Uh, it's an interesting uh, thing when you are on the consumption side as opposed to the supply side. My entire career before this was designing and building things that I thought my customers needed, right? But when I got to the other side and I looked at it saying, why am I paying for all this crap that I don't need? <laughs> so, so I went on a campaign to, to talk to my suppliers, you know, AMD, Intel, and the OEMs, and said, 
I don't want to buy what you're building. I want you to build what I need. And one of the, the other uh, learnings was that you reach a different conclusion when you look at things at the chip level or even at a single server level. In, at cloud scale, the data center is the computer. And you think of it holistically, you reach some very different conclusions. So we defined, my team defined a set of cloud-optimized high-density servers uh, that were half-width, so you could fit two uh, in a, in a one-use slot. There was no redundancy anywhere. If a, if a server failed, the, the software kind of worked around it. Uh, we took a, a, a sort of conceptual design to two of our OEMs. Uh, one um, fit that in a, in a 12U chassis, gave us 24 in a 12U chassis. The other one gave us eight in a 4U chassis, but it met our needs. So now to, to where I am. I joined Qualcomm uh, a year and a half ago uh, to kind of uh, take me to the next adventure. Uh, I observed over the, the last 40 years that disruptions always come from below. Our mainframes were eaten into by many computers, which were eaten into risk systems, desktop PCs, and so on. And I think the next wave is going to be smartphone technology. So we're in the era of small cores now. And it can either be Atom, it can be AMD's Bobcat, or ARM from a, 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 any variety of, of suppliers. And if you read the press, there are a lot of companies that are investing in, in, in microservers. Uh, either you know, Intel has an Atom-based uh, eight-core processor. Uh, there are several others that are doing it with, with, with ARM. Uh, I got myself into trouble a few years ago when I was still at Microsoft asking for a 16-core uh, small core uh, server SOC, uh, Intel only gave me eight. So the smartphone era is really changing how we operate. Even today, you see a lot of people are happy with just a tablet. That's their one and only computer. The only problem with, with having the phone as your only computer is the screen size. Now, I can see a world in which you kind of uh, take your, your smartphone home, you lay it down, it wirelessly connects to a larger display, keyboard, et cetera, and that's your only computer. Uh, you can see the, the volume economics in, in play. If you look at the number of uh, mobile phones, they're an order of magnitude higher numbers than uh, PCs or tablets. Uh, to again put some numbers, uh, the analysts expect that there'll be about 7 billion uh, smartphones, and this is not all mobile phones, just smartphones, that will ship between 2013 and 2017. Now, before I joined Qualcomm, I used to think, how complex can it be inside one of these uh, little phones? But when I talked to the architects there, I was, oh my god, you know, this picture looks just like a high-end PC or a, or a high-end uh, server. Uh, multiple cores, cache coherency. The only difference is that this has to fit in a much smaller die and not consume more than two watts. So uh, technology cycles kind of last in about 10 years. And there are a lot of people who are smarter in predicting the future who think that the next wave is going to be wearables and uh, the in internet of, uh, of things. So in conclusion, uh, one of the lessons I learned over the 40 years is in order to survive, uh, you have to learn to wear many hats. And I'll, I'll end with uh, my favorite quote from the mayor of Silicon Valley and the founder of Intel, don't be encumbered by past history. Go off and do something wonderful. So with that, I'll take a few questions. You can grab a seat right over here. Well, thank you very much, Dalit. That was a very, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, when I was looking at these slides earlier, um, I thought it actually created incredible history of the computing world. By the I mean, way, I'm going to post the slides on SlideShare so you can look at pieces that I glossed over in going through uh, slides at one, one every 45 seconds. Excellent. It's quite, very, very interesting. So we have some questions from the audience here. Um, first one is, please explain further how the risk-sysc question was resolved. The risk this question was resolved in the marketplace, right? For, for a while, uh, when I was at, at DEC, the, the risk processors, Park and MIPS mainly, uh, ate into our WAX SISC systems, so risk one. But then 
when Intel came out with the P6, it kind of flipped again. And when we went to out-of-order engines, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, the out-of-order x86 uh, could deliver just as much performance as the out-of-order RISC machines. The RISC machines also had to go to originally RISC meant simpler implementations, and that kind of fell off very, very quick, quickly. And when they had to go to out-of-order implementations, uh, it leveled the playing field. So it's really the classic thing, the marketplace really Correct. defined. Yeah. And as yeah. I said, volume economics does matter. Uh, the argument for risk was you can deliver, you can design a risk processor with fewer people uh, at a lower cost. Well, Intel could afford, given their volume, a thousand people on a, on a project when the risk guys could only afford to put a hundred. And given their volume, uh, they could justify that across the number of chips they were going to sell. So it's not just about uh, architecture and technical excellence. Business factors are just as important. Great, thank you. Next question. Intel managed to evolve the x86 architecture while maintaining backward compatibility. Do you think digital could have done the same thing with the VAX? It's not, the, the VAX was very complex. And we had looked at a number of ways to uh, uh, push its performance. Uh, like I said, at that time, I didn't think even Intel could do an out of order uh, x86 and get it to work. We didn't think we could do it with VAX. M maybe we were too timid. Uh, we didn't. Uh, but it, it wasn't necessary for us to, to stay with VAX. We could have moved on to, if we had invested fully in MIPS. We had the architecture license to design our own MIPS chips. So if MIPS couldn't deliver uh, R4000s on time that were fast enough, instead of doing EV4 with the alpha instruction set, we should have done EV4 with the MIPS instruction set. And, and that would have been much better for digital as a company. And I say that as uh, one of the alpha architects. Interesting, thank you. I have a couple questions I'm gonna combine here. Uh, one of them is, what do you think should be done about the low number of women and minorities in your field? And also, what do you recommend to high school students that are interested in your field? Just import more people from India and China. <laughs> no, the, 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 the problem is not hiring. The, the problem is, and it's not even our education system, the problem is us as parents who don't value science and technology and then we go out and complain that there aren't enough women and minorities uh, in the technical field. Mm -hmm. I, I came into this country as a minority from a third world country, and I was successful, okay? There's no, and my own children wouldn't follow into that, that same, same field because I couldn't motivate them to do that. They were more interested in their, you know, whatever they, they, could, they could get. So it's, it's, it's the problem with how, there's, a, there's an interesting book, I, I said, it's either nerds, why we need more of them, or, or geeks, why we need more of them. Uh, look at that book, and it, it clearly explains uh, that it's not our education system, it's us as parents failing to instill the value system that our parents instilled in, in, in us. Interesting answer, thank you. Can Intel win in the Internet of Things and wearables marketplace with the x86? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's uh, a lot to be said for that. Knowing what you know now, what, what would you have done differently over the years? That's interesting. I, I don't like to look in the rearview mirror. Maybe I stayed in some of my jobs where I was frustrated too long, but I didn't want to jump from the frying pan into the fire. So, I waited until something else found me. And through all of the, the, the changes I went through in, in, in jobs, it kind of struck me that when people came to me wanting me to join them, that worked out much better than me calling somebody and say, do you have a job for me? So maybe I was too patient, but I wouldn't change anything. Yeah, you know, I think I agree with you. I'm, I'm an independent consultant yeah, myself, yeah. and I've been able to have things kind of come to me based on things like, I talk about my involvement with IEEE, I've had so many opportunities come my way because of that. So the natural synergy when you give something, you get something back, would you say that's kind of a 
in some ways accurate? Yeah, I mean, even to, to, to give another example, I was, uh, there were times at Intel where I was very, very frustrated. So during that time, uh, I was on loan to investor relations. This was the time when the Core 2 Duo was launched in 2006, and we were you know, coming back on track. So I spent a lot of my time traveling, talking to small and large investors, convincing them that you know, Intel was a good investment, we we're back on track. We're going, and that was a fun experience. So that's the sort of learn to wear many hats. So if what, you're, what, you're, what you're doing is frustrating, find something else that you can be excited about. Great, thanks. What would you say are the two or three most important digital events in Silicon Valley's history? Oh God, Silicon Valley has such a rich history. Uh, I, I think it all starts with uh, uh, Fred Terman kind of establishing the framework for Silicon Valley to, to happen. Uh, the whole, I think, Fairchild, Schottky Semiconductor, Fairchild, Intel being, being formed. So this is the semiconductor part, right? And then more recently, it's sort of uh, Google, Facebook. So it's kind of changing from purely devices, semiconductor, you know, Apple with all, all of the things. So it's hard to name just a, a, a few. But those are the things that, that come, come to mind. Uh. You know, when uh, Mike Malone was here uh, talking about his new book uh, two or three weeks ago at, at one of these yeah, new time yeah. events, uh, about the new book called Intel Trinity. One of the things he mentioned was he thought that um, Robert Noyce was the mayor of Silicon right. Valley and that there's no, been nobody since that time. Yep. Would you agree with that? Or wh how much of a face of Silicon Valley do we need and is that important? I've been away from the, the, from the valley and I'm not sure that in, in today's day and age that a single person can fill that role. Uh, as long as, as pe people are excited about the, the valley and, and their job opportunities for people and young people see their future in, in some of these technology companies, I think I'd settle for that. Uh -huh. I have one last question for you. Yeah. What material beyond silicon do you think uh, is gonna be used in future computing devices? I think you should ask somebody at, at, at Intel. Uh, let's, let's talk about 3.5 uh, 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 gallium arsenide, the people talking about uh, carbon nanotubes uh, and lots of others. I'm, I'm not a uh, a, a semiconductor materials uh, expert, uh, but it's, it's clear that we're going to have to do something radically different to keep Moore's law going. I mean, Intel already in, in 22 nanometer did the, uh, the, the 3D transistors, maybe different material, uh, the, the high K. So it's not just silicon, but it's also additional dopants or additional materials. Uh, I'm not the expert on that. Okay. I want to thank you for your talk today, and I have a thank you gift from the museum. You were, I noticed you were looking at the exhibit downstairs called Fearless Genius. So this is a book with photographs from that exhibit as well as other photographs by the photographer as a thank you gift. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.